Welcome everyone to the Police Community Advisory Committee meeting. Today's date is Wednesday, March 27th, 2024, and I call this meeting to order at 5 p.m. I'd like to welcome our new PCAC member, Maria Garcia. Maria was appointed to our committee by Mayor Craig. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Now, if everybody will please rise and join us on the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Martha, will you please do a roll call? Yes. Committee member Garcia? Here. Committee member Eddie? Here. Committee member Perez? Here. Committee member De La Rosa? Here. Committee member Guillory? Present. Committee member Manso? Chair Miller? Here. At this time, I'd like to review public comment procedures. Public comments are generally limited to two minutes per speaker. I may further the time limit for public comments depending on the agenda and schedule. We are now open for public comment on items that are not on the agenda and that are in the city of Salinas's subject matter jurisdiction. Comments on agenda items should be held until the items are reached. Good evening, name is Eric Peterson. And uh, I've heard that the Salinas Police Department has received a six-figure uh, grant for bicycle safety. And I've got three quick comments on that. First of all, when the program is put together, uh, if there could be a presentation at the TMC Bicycle Protection Facilities Advisory Committee, uh, there are several of us from Salinas on that committee, and uh, it might in, encourage other jurisdictions to do similar things. Second, I'd like to volunteer to whatever uh, I can do to help. Uh, I, when Palo Alto first started their uh, bikeway system, uh, I was uh, hired under a federal grant. And uh, we had a pretty good program, uh, included enforcement, included being in the schools. And I have good memories of that and all that. And the third thing is this is just one more reason why the City of Salinas needs to bring back the Bicycle Advisory Committee. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other public comments not related to the agenda items? Moving on to the consent agenda. The approval of minutes from the November 23rd, 2023 meeting. Are there any questions or comments from the committee members? I'll begin on my right. No comment. No comments. No comments. No comments. <clears throat> no comments. Martha, are there any public comments on this item? No comments were received. Is there a motion and a second to approve the minutes? I so move. I'm sorry, can you tell me who, who made the motion? Yes, so with a motion from uh, McGregor Eddy and a second from Leo De La Rosa, we will have a roll call vote. Committee member Garcia? I'm a little lost on that one. <laughs> when, yes. When was, yes? Okay. Yes. Committee member Eddy? Yes. Committee member Perez? Yes. Committee member De La Rosa? Yes. Committee member Guillory? Yes. Committee member Marzo is not here yet. And Chair Miller? Yes. Thank you. Pass, uh, motion pass. Consideration to approve the proposed 2024 meeting calendar for the Police Community Advisory Committee. 
Are there any questions or comments in terms of the proposed calendar that we all have in front of us? The yellow dates would be the proposed PCAC meeting dates. Uh, I'll start with questions and comments from committee members on my right. No comment. No, no comment. Thank you for providing the schedule. No comments. No comment. No comments. I myself will not be able to attend the April meeting date. So if uh, we can, I guess, check with committee member Momzo to see if she'll be able to as the co-chair. Yes, unless you want to move it to a different um, well, the third week. If not, we can get a, um, your um, another sure. person to cover for you. Would the 17th work for everybody, the Wednesday prior to that Wednesday, the 24th? Of April? Mm -hmm. Yes, that, I would, that would be better for me, too. I'll be out of town the 24th, but not the 17th. Okay. That would Never. actually be good. That's fine with me. Okay, so we'll motion to move the April 24th to April 17th, please. And with that, are there any public comments on this item? Okay. So can we have a motion and then a second? Yes, we'll have a motion and a second to approve the calendar as a whole with the uh, modification of the April meeting from the 24th to the 17th. So if we could please have a motion and a second. A motion to approve it. Okay. With a motion from committee member Garcia and a second from committee member Eddy, we will have a roll call vote, Martha. Yes. Committee member Garcia? Yes. Committee, committee member Eddy? Yes. Committee member Perez? Yes. Committee member De La Rosa? Yes. Committee member Guillory? Yes. A Chair Miller? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. I'm assuming it's something about the... I, ap yeah, I apologize for that. I totally forgot about that. <laughs> no Just worries. Just a minor detail. So. I thought it went too smooth. <laughs> I thought it was too smooth. Thank you, Tanya. We'll, Thank you, Tanya. So we'll figure out an alternative. <laughs> it may not be the 17th. <laughs> so, um, we can leave it the way it is, and then we get a, uh, I believe, um, uh, committee member De La Rosa is the vice. Is it Vice or who is the vice? I will check. Manso. Yeah. Manso. Yeah. Okay. Yes, that's true. Manso is the vice. So um, she will uh, handle the meeting. Okay. So thank you. I apologize for that. Okay. <laughs> yes, we're going to stay uh, with the fourth Wednesday. That way we do not interfere with any other uh, meetings. And again, I apologize for that. And no. So just note now, if it's going to be on the 24th, I will not be here. Okay. okay. Yes, as long as we have uh, four committee members attending, we will have a quorum. Thank you. Sure. Thank you all. Uh, we'll move on to presentations. The police department staffing update will be presented to us by Acting Chief Murray. It's been a while since I've been in front of the PCAC and I figure some of you probably are not familiar with who I am. As you mentioned, I'm the acting chief at the moment. I'm the assistant chief of police. I've been with the department 28 years. I'm a Salinas native. I went to North County High School. After my time in the military, I came back to Salinas. I've been uh, an officer here exclusively. So it's nice to be in front of you all today. I appreciate the fact that we haven't had a chance to get together with the transition that's taken place in the department. So thank you. I'm going to go over our staffing report. So our current staffing, sworn staffing levels, we have 27 officer vacancies, 23 funded, four are frozen. This does not include the 11 sworn positions permanently eliminated as part of the fiscal year 23, part of that budget process. We have 134 sworn positions filled at the moment. 
that includes two recruits uh, in the academy, going to the academy, six officers in field training, 16 officers out on leave, two officers on light duty. That means only 108 are fully trained officers on duty at the moment. Sworn staffing levels, you can look at the comparison of previous years. Officer vacancies, uh, currently we're at 27 vacancies. You can see the comparison to the two previous years. Sworn positions filled, so we're, we're actually lower than the previous years. Our staffing levels have continued to decline, unfortunately. We're doing a number of things to combat that. I'm happy to get into that later. Recruits in the academy. Uh, as of right now, we just had five graduate the academy about two weeks ago. Uh, we were excited to be there for that. Welcome them on board the Salinas Police Department. So we have two in the academy at the moment. Officers in the field training program. There's six officers in that program. That includes the five who just recently graduated, as I mentioned. We're excited about that. Officers out on leave, currently 16. Officers on light duty, too. And I know you're well aware that when officers are out completely or on light duty, they're not fully, fully available to work full duty as a sworn police officer. So that does present challenges. Our fully trained officers on duty at the moment, 108 in comparison to uh, last year, 109, and the previous year, 119. We never want to forget our professional staff, our unsworn positions. They're a critical part of our police department. We currently have 44 professional staff positions filled. Includes two limited term CalVIP uh, grant funded positions, nine professional staff vacancies. That includes four police services technician vacancies. A very critical part of our overall team effort. Those are critical positions and that certainly presents challenges. One community service aid vacancy, they work the front desk. Two multi-service officer vacancies. One community outreach assistant vacancy, it's grant funded. And one community service officer. We have about a 17% vacancy rate, uh, the same as our sworn staff. So it's a challenge on both sides of our, our house. Switching gears a little bit, calls for service, 2023. Total of 138,080 calls for service. Priority one through four, these are our high priority urgent calls. 109,416. Online reports, 3,400. Total police reports taken, 8,546. So that doesn't seem like a big number. What's important to remember is that 8,000 some odd is not, those are not just calls for service. Those are the ones which we actually completed police reports on. So 138,000 some odd uh, calls for service is quite a lot. Front desk, we had 14,566 customers at the front desk. I think about that, that's the population of some small towns is coming through the front desk of the police department for service. And we're pretty happy about the fact that on average about five, five minutes, five minutes, 15 seconds for uh, those customers to be served. And the focus of our department is of course service, so that's, that's a good stat. The percentage of calls officers on scene in under four minutes of le or less, 90.5%. And the percentage of calls where officers were on scene in under three minutes or less is 84.7%. So those are, those are great response times. It's important to remember that those are talking about priority calls, right? Life and death are need for us to get there immediately. Uh, other calls, those can pend, and they can pend for quite a while because of our staffing levels. A little five-year cons comparison on our response times. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, for the calendar year 2023, you can see the numbers there, uh, about 1,300. Uh, less than three minute response time, 1,400, less than four minutes. I just touched on that a minute ago. Um, our response time is about in the 90th percentile, less than four minutes. And again, those are for critical responses. You can see that caveat at the bottom there. I'm happy to come back to that if you want to look at it further. So some of our recent efforts. Very excited about this. We recently raised our hiring incentives for both lateral officers, officers coming from other agencies, and for new recruits who raised it up to $40,000 for lateral officers and $20,000 for new recruits coming to the department. Uh, that's important for a number of reasons. Every police agency is competing for the same pool of candidates right now. It's difficult for all of us. So we have to be able to uh, offer some incentives to compete with other agencies. 
Um, I kind of give this example. You think of it on the scales. When somebody's working at a police department and they're considering whether or not to come to Salinas, maybe the $40,000 incentive isn't the entire reason they're going to come here, but it tips the scales in favor of that on somebody who may have been trying to make that decision. Same with the recruits. We launched our new recruitment website. We're very excited about that. You can see the, uh, the link there, joinspd.org. Tons of great information, nice graphics, one simple spot where whether you're a recruit or a lateral, you can go there, get firsthand information, you can fill out a contact card, and we're jumping on those immediately. When somebody sends one of those, I'm calling it a contact card, but somebody sends one of those messages, we're jumping on that right away, calling them up, texting them, emailing them, uh, at least making that initial contact, starting that conversation to get them to know that we're interested and excited about them looking at the Salinas Police Department. We've increased our advertising efforts. We uh, went to council, got approval for a uh, contract with iHeartMedia. Uh, that does include some radio spots, but more importantly, social media, podcasts, streaming services where people will see advertisements for the Salinas Police Department. I uh, kind of made the example when I spoke to council of I go to Gold's Gym right here in Salinas, and I take a moment to flick through my phone, and I'm seeing uh, social media ads for Gilroy Police Department doesn't help us. So we're now going to combat that using some geofencing and different tools. And people in the local area will be seeing advertisement for the Salinas Police Department. So that'll be great for our recruiting efforts. So one point uh, I'm making here that's really important that we've been good about thinking about is enticing people to come to the Salinas Police Department is, is super important to us right now. But we also have to recognize the employees that we have, both sworn and professional staff. And we're doing that. And we're thinking of different ways that we can show them their value, and focus on retaining a lot of that talent. Uh, I know you know that in recent years we've had officers uh, with a great deal of experience, unfortunately, leave Salinas to go to other surrounding agencies. Silicon Valley's just up the road. And we have to find ways to get officers to stay here. Because once we've invested $120,000 in training a new officer, by the time they're a solo beat officer, that's probably a low estimate at this point. But once we've reached that, tremendous investment. It's essential for us to keep those, those employees here in Salinas. Part of our strategy is recruiting locally, investing in people who are from here, want to stay here, are going to stay here for 28 years like I did. That's our goal. And my contact information is there. And of course, if you have any questions, comments, I'm happy to take those. Thank you. Right. Thank you for stepping in as acting chief as well. Okay. Um, committee members, do we have any questions or comments regarding this presentation? I'm going to start on my right with committee member Garcia. Questions? Yes, I have a few questions. Thank you, <laughs> Officer Murray. Um, so I was making a note. If we could go back to the slide that had the comparison to previous years, because um, I think it's interesting that last year there was a shift in what type of calls would be um, contingent on an officer arriving on the scene. So while we have some good data, sharp times, that's beautiful, um, we have to take into consideration like loitering, I think it was... Um, not all car accidents were going to have an officer if there wasn't a suspected injury. So there was a list that we were provided where they weren't going to send officers anymore. So did we take that into account with this data? Because it looks like the same amount, 1,350 from 2022 to 1,392. Yeah, you or mean do the, you have a comment on how? You, you mean how are we still responding to the same number of calls for service, even though we had the reduction in service that you're mm -hmm. referencing? So here's the thing with that. The reduction in calls for service, has, it's simple math. If we have 10 officers in service in the city of Salinas and we have 30 calls pending, we're only going to get to those 10 calls immediately. The rest of those calls have to wait. They're, they're mm -hmm. going to pen for quite a while. Uh, in terms of not responding, we, we've tried to find different ways to deal with some of those calls because we don't want people in the community having to wait. Definitely. So when we can get on the phone, talk to them about different options. Can you make an online report? Can you come in at the front counter if you want to interact with one of our professional staff? We can do it that way. We can make mm -hmm. a report that way. Uh, the other option is it can pend, and it can pend for quite a while. It may be tomorrow before we get to it. And there are some calls that... Um, 
for lack of a better term, we consider nuisance calls. Yeah, the neighbor's kid kicked his ball over my fence into my yard. I want the police to come. We're not coming to that call. So Understand. our command staff, our supervisors make some discretionary calls about that. But mm -hmm. the number of calls coming into the police department hasn't changed. It's how we respond to those calls that, that has changed. Yeah, and then the follow-up question I have um, in the slide, the P1 through P4, the 109,416, what type of calls are those, the high-priority calls? The second circle, P1 through P4, calls sure. for service. Priority what one through four are, are, those are calls where there's a threat to life. Okay. But the suspect's still on scene, just using plain language, for example. Um, you know, an active call where there's still potential for violence or harm to human life. Mm -hmm. Those are the critical calls. Would domestic violence fall into Absolutely. that category? Yeah. Okay. So, but even a domestic violence call, if it's, if it's ongoing, if a neighbor's calling because they're hearing a fight next door, it's a husband and wife, it's a domestic violence call, it sounds like somebody's screaming for help, we're going to go to that code three, lights and sirens, right? It's an immediate response. You're going to get a three to you know, four minute, probably faster than that response. If it's past tense, I'm calling the police because my spouse hit me earlier in the day and my spouse mm -hmm. is no longer at the, the home. That's not, a, that's not a, a, a code three response for us. We can get to that. It's an urgent call for sure. But we, can, we have a little more discretion on how quickly we get to that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for that. And then the last comment that I, I or question slash comment, you stated that all of the police agencies are having the same struggle with hiring. And I'm wondering if that message is being communicated to our community at large. Because when we talk about staffing, right, you got a lot of debates online and a lot of kind of chatter in the community. So I'm wondering if there's a way to kind of do a PSA, if this is statewide, if this is nationwide, like everybody's hurting for officers right now, it's not a Salinas critical thing. That's a good suggestion, yeah. Mm -hmm. No, every opportunity I have to speak about the topic, mm -hmm. I, I stress that. It's, it's a national issue in addition to one here in California. It's just like anything else, it's supply and demand. All these police agencies are competing for the small candidate pool. Unfortunately, nationally in recent years, uh, the profession has, the perception of the profession has changed. Um, look, and part of that is because of the police themselves. We have to recognize that. Things have changed, how we're viewed. Um, so everybody's competing for a smaller candidate pool. People are less interested in being police officers, and part of our job is to, to change that perception. When I paint with a broad brush and say that we're all hurting, some more than others, if I pointed out Silicon Valley where they mm -hmm. have deep pockets and they have a folks. lot of funding, mm -hmm. uh, they obviously have a lot more opportunity to recruit people than we do. But your point's well taken. We can get that message out. And then my <clears throat> last comment, you said nuisance calls. So I'm wondering, you know, we've had an increase in the racing and the sideshows. Mm -hmm. What category would that fall under? And then I know the fireworks around summertime, right? You got everybody and their mama calling about, I hear a firework, this or that. Like, do you have a different category for the what you would consider nuisance, nuisance calls? Sure. Or maybe there's not a response immediately, but it's like something the force is aware of and they're trying to strategize on different approaches. Sure. Mm -hmm. The service is aware that uh, calls like that are certainly not a nuisance. Uh, when I say a nuisance call, what I mean is, uh, you know, a call that not probably, life probably, threatening. probably I'm, doesn't I'm, need the police yeah. at all, mm -hmm. really. I think all of us would probably agree to that. Fireworks, uh, the sideshows, those are important calls. Um, those those sideshows, they can cause serious injuries. There, There is risk of life there. Uh, we take those very seriously. We respond to those as medi immediately uh, when we're available to do so. And we try to be proactive in keeping those events from taking place. The same with fireworks. Uh, you know, it's all fun and games until somebody's roof catches on fire. Uh, there are city ordinances regarding fireworks. We have safe and sane, and then we have fireworks that, uh, um, that are illegal. And we treat it as such. Mm -hmm. I live in Salinas. So I always worry about that myself. It drives my dog crazy. Mm -hmm. um, so I recognize when people call about that. That's a real quality of life concern. No, it's yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Uh, on this uh, staffing update, this report and all. Um, I don't know whether it's this spot here where were you approved with city council for. Uh, to hire a recruiting agency? Are you thinking about the, uh, the contract for iHeartMedia? Were you approved of that? 
Would you, did the city council approve hiring a, a recruiting agency? Well, if, police you, officers? if you're referring to the iHeart Media contract, they did approve that. It's an advertising contract, yes. Anybody uh, 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 filled out applications so far? Have we gotten the applicants as a result? We get applicants all the time. Uh, it's whether or not we can attribute it to that yet. No, we haven't actually started that campaign yet, but I expect a spike in interest as a result of that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have any public comments on the presentation that we just received? Good evening again. My name is Eric Peterson. And a comment and a question. Uh, the comment is, John was a little modest. I won't try to embarrass him. But I was on PCAC and, uh, for one of his presentations. And it was just simply excellent. I still remember how good it was. Uh, the question, and I probably should know the answer to this, but is there any chance of like maybe shaving some of the staffing on graveyard shift or something like weeknights? or anything like that to uh, maybe give somebody a night off who didn't want to come in on overtime? Yeah, I like the way you think. Uh, we actually engage in, in conversations about that all the time. We look at where we can best utilize our resources based on the need. There's obviously certain times of the day that are more busy than others, and we try to strategize on how best to use the limited resources that we have. So it's constant conversation, and it depends on the time of year, the weather, a whole host of factors that influence when there's going to be the most calls for service. Well. Thank you. Any other public comments on this presentation? No action will be taken. We'll now move on to a presentation about the 2023 Assembly Bill 481 Annual Report, and Acting Chief Mary will also present this to us. All right, I'm going to present on the annual report for Assembly Bill 481, which uh, includes a report on military equipment used by law enforcement. I know you're aware of some of this. Ordinance adding Article 3 to Chapter 27, the Salinas Municipal Code, pertaining to the military equipment use policy in compliance with Assembly Bill AB 481, adopted by the City Council August 23rd of 2022. The ordinance renewal by City Council on August 22 of 2023. And annual report was released on March 16th of 2024. We released that publicly by social media and other outlets. Our PCAC meeting to discuss this report, we're having it right now. The community meeting to discuss uh, AB 481, our annual report, will be on April 15th, 2024. City Council meeting for renewal of the ordinance on April 23rd, 2024. So there's a number of categories, as you all well know. I'm going to touch on the ones that uh, we have equipment related to. And then, of course, I'll answer any questions. Unmanned aerial systems, commonly called drones. The purpose, therefore, supporting law enforcement operations to preserve life and enhance public safety. And that's really key. That's the primary use for, for uh, these unmanned aerial vehicles. Uh, they may be deployed when an overhead view would assist officers with an incident, commanders with planning and responding to situations such as collecting evidence in the form of aerial photography and video that's used after the fact of an incident. Fleeing suspects or hostage situations gives us a bird's eye view. High risk search warrants, our SWAT team uses them to get an eye on the location before we make entry. Major traffic collision assessments and mutual aid support, uh, for example, for the fire department, uh, floods, other uses. Number of authorized uses, we had 312. Annual cost, those are the costs of maintenance, replacement, uh, we'll get more into it, but our drones were of critical value at the uh, Sun Street incident where we had a nine-hour standoff with an armed gunman who engaged us in gunfire throughout that entire time. We also have remotely powered uh, ground vehicles. It says robots, but the, you know, we think robots, we think these autonomous things, but these are controlled by operators on the ground, of course. They're used during critical incidents to rem remotely gain visual and audio information or 
uh, deployed for a specific purpose to increase safety for the officers and the community. Uh, use examples, inspect dangerous locations from a position of safe, safety, locate a barricaded subject, deliver hostage negotiations, phones, open doors, we can push doors open with those, clear buildings and housing, uh, two-way communication tool. The bottom one there is handheld. You can pick that up and throw it in a window, drop it in a balcony. And what it does, all of these, what they do is they allow us an opportunity to see an, age, an area of critical danger without putting a human being there. And I've been part of those operations where these tools have been in place and we've seen the suspect armed and we've been able to address that from a distance, which helps everyone, including the suspect. Our MRAP vehicles, uh, we refer to them as Rescue 1 and Rescue 2. We've had these for a number of years now. Their primary use is to safely transport personnel to and from critical incidents, extract citizens from volatile situations, authorized uses to support SWAT, VSTF, our Violent Suppression Task Force, or patrol during critical incidents. They're used for pre-planned high-risk search warrants. And, and they're used when greater protection is required. Uh, personal body armor. The, essentially, I always tell people these are large rolling bank vaults, big thick metal that protect the people inside from bullets and other dangers. Provide mutual aid to mutual natural disasters, excuse me, such as large-scale fires or flooding and community events. We have deployed uh, these vehicles 28 times for all these circumstances that I just described, but we've also deployed them um, in the recent floods. Uh, we've deployed them to assist CHP on the highway. A uh, whole host of uh, uses that essentially save lives. The annual cost is $2,079.10, and that's upkeep, maintenance, mechanic work. Unauthorized use or complaints, we had one. It's usually related to whether or not, and it's a fair question to ask whether or not uh, something like this is necessary for the police or necessary in the public display. Um, yes, ma'am? Yeah, I was the complaint, and that's not quite the way it was. I can clarify okay. later. Very good. That was my complaint. It was your complaint. You're the one. Got it. <laughs> Our SPD mobile command vehicle, this falls under Category 5. Let me step back one thing here. I'm going to make the same comment about the mobile command vehicle. These two vehicles have no offensive capabilities. There's no weapons on them. Uh, I always assume that's obvious, but I think to a lot of the community, it's probably not. Um, they're, they're, again, there's no weapons on them. There's no offensive capabilities. It's just a large rolling uh, bank vault. The same with our mobile command vehicles. These provide command response. Um, to critical incidents and natural disasters, a mobile base of operations in which fully contained, equipped with communications equipment, other large scale events to provide high visibility and public safety. We'll roll these out when we have a standoff or we have some kind of critical incident. But we also use this vehicle for community events, rodeo, different places where it's, a, it's basically a mobile police station for us where we can operate out of that and have a location where we can uh, coordinate. Our ICAC vehicle. That's the bottom one pictured there. It's used as part of a county-wide task force to aid in the response to technology-facilitated child sexual exploitation and internet crimes. It's basically a, a rolling mobile forensic computer lab. Valuable tool and an asset throughout the county. The statistics for last year, number of authorized uses, three. Uh, annual costs, again, upkeep, $1,000, $1,370.52. No complaints about the use of these vehicles. The uh, ICAC vehicle there, the annual cost is 700 odd dollars. Number of uses, three. Switching gears, breaching rounds. So these are very, they, they look like shotgun rounds. That's essentially what they are. They're quick to, used to quickly defeat locked doors in situations where delay would be dangerous to officers or occupants. Basically like a hostage rescue type situation where we couldn't be uh, held up at the door. Uh, they're frangible, which means they, bra they, they break apart, they come apart when they strike the locking mechanism, so there's no flying debris coming out the other side. Um, making penetration through a barrier less likely. Authorized use examples, available to use in high-risk incidents in order to expeditiously gain access, which is what I just described to you. Uh, the note there, their frangible breaching rounds are designed to destroy the object that hits and then disperse into a relatively harmless powder. 
Number of uses, zero. No uses in the past year. Annual costs, none. No complaints related to that. Breaching shotguns. These are the shotguns that fire those rounds. Their purpose is to quickly defeat locked doors in situations where delay would be dangerous to officers or occupants. Examples of use, what I just described. High risk incidents such as an active shooter situation or an arrest of a potentially heavily armed individual. If we had to respond to an active shooter situation, we needed to get into a room very quickly. This is an option for breaching that door and getting inside and saving children. Number of authorized uses, <coughs> thankfully, zero. Annual costs, also zero. No complaints related to these items. Specialized firearms and ammunition. Of course, our SWAT team has specialized weapons. Their purpose, SPD equips officers to address risks posed to the public and department members by violent, sometimes well-armed individuals. I mentioned Sun Street last May. That's exactly what that was. These firearms are to be used as precision weapons to address the threat with more precision and or greater distance than a handgun. A uh, handgun is a defensive tool. Uh, long guns are um, critical for these types of high-risk situations. Examples, I already mentioned active shooters, well-armed individuals, barricaded subjects. Number of authorized uses, one, and that's again Sun Street. Annual cost, zero. Unauthorized use or complaints, zero. You're going to see a recurring theme in this past year, and it's Sun Street, the incident that I'm referring to. I think you're aware. If you have questions about that, I'm happy to answer it. Category 11, firearms accessories designed to launch explosive uh, projectiles. It's a bit of a uh, fallacy there. Um, that is what it's designed for. It's not what it's used for here. To limit the escalation of conflict by the use of less lethal options in conjunction with de-escalation tactics when feasible, SPD does not utilize this piece of equipment as designed, which is for explosive. SPD um, does not ex possess explosive uh, projectiles. This is used in the same manner as a 40 millimeter. It launches a less lethal round. It can also be used to launch uh, gas. Uh, in a hostage situation or in a barricaded subject, we can use this to launch uh, 40 millimeter uh, gas into a dwelling. Number of authorized uses, zero. Annual cost, zero. And uh, no complaints or unauthorized use associated with this. So distraction devices, commonly referred to as flashbangs. They are light sound diversionary devices that may be considered when its use would potentially reduce the risk of injury during a uh, critical incident. Except in emergencies, life-threatening situations, light sound diversionary devices shall not be used without prior authoriz authorization of the tactical commander or team leader. Examples, barricaded subject or hostage situation or high-risk warrant service to distract potentially violent individuals. So really quickly, how these are commonly used, our SWAT team, our high-risk entry teams, going into a dwelling where your adversary is in there and potentially armed is very risky. Uh, we throw one of these inside in a controlled fashion. It lets out a tremendous amount of light, makes a very loud bang. It startles the person inside, uh, buys the operators, the, the officers going inside about two seconds, which doesn't sound like a long time, but it's enough time to get inside and um, surprise the people so that we can uh, take them into custody without incident. It's a very valuable tool. Number of authorized uses, 24. Annual cost, zero. Un unauthorized use or complaints, zero. Continuing, distraction devices, chemical agents and smoke canisters. Chemical agents, munitions commonly referred to as tear gas. Um, we use these after a suspect's been given numerous opportunities to surrender peacefully in a prolonged standoff. Tactical commander uh, reaches a point where he's satisfied, he or she is satisfied that negotiations uh, are not pro progressing and we need to get the suspect into custody. We'll introduce gas in this fashion uh, and it, it makes the person very uncomfortable, forces them to come outside. And again, barricaded subject based on circumstances. Number of authorized uses, 52. That's going to be related to Sun Street again. Annual cost, zero. Unauthorized use or complaints, zero. 40 millimeter projectile launchers, very valuable tool. Great escalation, de escalation tool for us. Um, the purpose is to limit escalation of conflict by the use of less lethal options in conjunction with de escalation tactics when feasible. Uh, examples of use person is armed with a weapon and the circumstances allow for the safe application of approved munitions. 
somebody standing at distance with a weapon. This shoots a, a foam rubber projectile, uh, and more often than not, it gets compliance from the person, um, and it's a, a de-escalation in terms of the option of using a firearm, which we don't want to do. Person is made credible with threats to harm themselves, harm others. There's probable cause to believe that the person has committed a crime of violence and refuses to comply with lawful orders. That's where we would use this, and we've used it um, quite effectively. Number of authorized uses, 16. Annual cost, uh, $2,602.36. Unauthorized use or complaints, zero. Last year's purchasing requests. Uh, the drones, they're under category one. The, you can see a number of them. It was during the Sun Street incident that uh, eight of the drones were shot down by the suspect. Yep, took them out of commission. We had to replace all of those. Fortunately, they were insured, so insurance costs uh, covered that, savings to the taxpayer. Um, you know, it was unfortunate those were destroyed, but uh, we gained valuable insight from those drones that probably saved lives, so better the drones than one of the officers or a member of the community, obviously. Specialized ammunition of less than 50 caliber, a replenishment of 308 and uh, 338 ammunition, that's because of Sun Street, because of the rounds that were expended there. Distraction devices, uh, replenishment of the flashbangs and chemical agents, smoke canisters, 40 millimeter launchers, uh, one single launcher. This year we anticipate in 2024 uh, precision rifles. Our current ones are old and need to be replaced and uh, we'll be going before council on that in the coming year. And that's the end of the presentation, of course. If you have any questions, happy to answer them. Sun Street keeps coming up in that presentation for good reason. I'm happy to speak to you on that if you have questions about that. Thank you. We will begin with the committee a member comments and questions on the right with committee member Garcia. Just one question. Just one question. Um, do you share any of these resources with other cities, like if they need help or anything? It's a great question. We do have mutual aid agreements uh, where we cooperate with our surrounding agencies, and it's a force multiplier for all of us. Uh, we have on occasion called for other agencies to come and assist us, and, and they in turn have called for us to assist them. Sun Street is a great example. It's actually a sheriff's deputy that was shot in the doorway. Uh, they called for mutual aid. Everybody in the area responded. We responded, assisted with the evacuation of that deputy. And then because it was in the city of Salinas, our SWAT team took over that operation. So the answer, the short answer is yes. The long answer is all of that. We do cooperate and collaborate with state, local, and federal partners. What about the cost? Who shares the cost? Do they share costs with you when they are used? Yeah, there's actually a protocol in place that when you call for mutual aid, there's some understanding that those costs have to be uh, um, allocated accordingly. So yes. Thank you. No questions at this time. Thank you for sharing the information. No questions. Uh, yes, I would like to bring up to the whole to the committee. What? I'm pretty loud. I don't think I need. It. You can hear me. <laughs> I can hear you. Okay. So it's for the TV. Oh, for the TV. I apologize. Okay. Am I on correctly? Press the button. Got it. My name is McGregor Eddy. My concern, which I expressed in the past, is that when we have community events, we are and we bring the MRAP, which is a menacing looking vehicle, we are bringing it for fun and to sh come to Plaster Park to a f festival night, you know, with refreshments and music. And I think with community policing, this is not, despite all this equipment, these things are rarely used. Sun Street was not a typical day. So this kind of menacing warlike equipment to be voluntarily by policy brought out at festive events, I think shows a warlike face. Now, you, don't intend it to be warlike, but the kids playing on it, I watch them. It is seen as 
see, if they go home and play Call of Duty and their parents let them do it, that's one thing, to pretend that war is a game. But to have the police do it voluntarily, I think that is not the police's decision. I would like, if the police continues to do that, I think the city council should decide if we want to voluntarily take the trouble to bring this menacing vehicle out for children to play war on, because they do, and you know they do. Thank you very much. I think we need the face of peace. We need peace in our hearts, peace in our parks, peace in our land, and peace in our world. And we shouldn't bring it down because the kids like to play on it. We can have other things, maybe even a fire engine or something more constructive that would be a better face of your good service to this town than that menacing thing at community fairs. I request that we not display them at community events. That's my request. Thank you. And you can go ahead and push it. Sure. Uh, it's, not, it's not a request, it's just an opinion. I agree with uh, Eddie that maybe in, uh, maybe in Monterey or in Carmel, uh, it's different. Um, activities in a different environment, but in my district, uh, number two is it's a little it's a little hard to understand when we see those kind of um, activities with us um, things that she mentioned. So. My families and my district is they just looking an excuse mm -hmm. to do something. So don't let them to do those excuses to to do something that is not benefit for our community. You know I I think we need to be careful what we can do. In my case uh, I serve the community through the church. And I think it's not healthy to do that, especially in these Salinas. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ilya. Um, just a couple comments from me. One of them in terms of the MRAP, I'm not sure if um, either of you were on the committee, but Chief did a really good presentation about this. And he did mention that it's not used, as you said, there's not offensive weapons on it. And they used it when there was flooding and they had to have children load onto it. And so I think that the intention, from my understanding, is to kind of take away that war machine perception and have children feel comfortable. Because if they need it for help rather than being scared and intimidated, it's more of this is here to help us, not this is here to hurt us, is my interpretation. Though I understand with its appearance, we do need a little bit maybe more communication on what it's used for or you know, a picture of it being used in that flooding situation on display when it is at these types of events so that they know that it serves a purpose not just for protection for our officers, but also for safety in emergency situations. Um, so that was my understanding of it. Just wanted to share that with anybody that may not have been here for that presentation. And then I was also surprised to see the low annual costs on the equipment. Um, and it was nice to see that their cost appears to be relative to their usage. So it seems the things that you're not using as much, they're not very expensive. And the things that you are using, the cost kind of matches up with that, where sometimes we can see things that we're not using and their annual cost is really high. And this looks like everything is pretty relative. So that was nice to see. Do we have any public comments or questions on the item that was just presented? Hi, good evening. Uh, you know, um, just a, a comment. I wasn't going to say anything, but after hearing her talk about that, um, I grew up on the east side, and you know, 
it's not to intimidate people. It's to let people know, hey, this is what we have. We have these resources, and if we need to use them, we will use them. As far as the kids go, yeah, you know what? It could go interpret in a different way. A kid can be like, you know, that's an awesome vehicle. That's something that I would want to drive. That might inspire a little kid to go and join the academy to train so that maybe one day he can drive one of those vehicles. And I know that we're, we're in tough times and we're shortage of police. I, you know, I hear that on and on and on and on. But once again, you know, it doesn't help the police department when we have all this anti-police in our city and some of it in our city council. Now, how is that gonna help our police department if we're constantly just trying to push him down instead of propping him up? It's like, if you wanna help your community, then the best way to help your community is, you know what, do what's right for the community, not for ourselves. We have to work as a whole. And just props, you know, you guys are doing a great job and I know you're working with what you have, but I just wanted to say that, you know, let's use it in a positive way so that maybe it'll, it'll make people think twice before they do something dumb. That's my opinion. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for your comments. No action will be taken on this item. Do we have any other public comments? Okay, then we're going to go ahead and move on to the Chief's report. We'll receive a report from Acting Chief Murray. Thank you. Let's see. I'm going to start with uh, the purchase of vehicles. On uh, January 9th, uh, we went to City Council for the purchase of 17 police vehicles. That included a replacement for the Chief Vehicle, Assistant Chief, a VSTF vehicle, personnel and training, Organized retail theft grant uh, provided for three vehicles and 10 patrol vehicles. Uh, these are all replacements, vehicles that needed to be rotated. We also went on January 9th to City Council for a three year subscription to Celebrate Software for our computer forensics lab. This was fully funded by the organi Organized Retail Theft Grant. It was in the amount of $297,433.12. Uh, Celebrate is an important piece of software for us in computer forensics uh, investigations and removing and preserving evidence, so it was a critical piece for us. We went to the City Council on February 6th for a one-year subscription to Gray Key software uh, for a computer forensics lab in the amount of $33,105. Gray Key is another tool we use uh, to secure evidence. We went to the City Council on March 19th for an agreement with iHeartMedia for a comprehensive advertising and marketing campaign. It was in the amount of $54,800. I spoke to you a little bit about that. I'm happy to give you more details. We will be going to City Council on April 23rd for the acceptance of $75,000 ICAC grant, and that's the Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force, uh, to support ICAC-related training and technology purchases. We're going to City Council on April 23rd for the purchase of an alternative life sor light source machine, which is a piece of lab equipment that is used for locating fingerprints and other biological evidence in terms on items that would otherwise be difficult or nearly impossible to see. I think we've all seen that on television. It's a critical piece of uh, investigative equipment. Uh, that's in the amount of $86,423.99. currently working with the interim city manager and our finance department on the proposed uh, fiscal year 2024 to 25 budget and we'll give a presentation at next month's uh, PCAC meeting on that. That's a work in progress at the moment. It's that time of year for us. Currently finalizing the 2023 annual report and we'll be releasing soon. We'll give a presentation uh, again at next month's PCAC meeting. And that's it. Any questions? Of committee member comments and questions beginning on the right. No questions. Thank you, um, Officer Murray. So I have a clarifying statement. All of the dates that you just ran off, those requests were approved by the city council, correct? Correct. So I want to also like add and shed some light on what the gentleman just shared for the public comment, and thank you for being here. Because I think there's 
two different conversations that are happening. And I think if people were here present and they would hear this information directly from you, right, and they could go back and look at the minutes, they would see that the city in some, in a lot of ways has approved every request, meaning that they're in support of making sure that we address these challenges that the force is dealing with. So I appreciate you giving the chronology and I appreciate you just clarifying right now that all of those requests have indeed been approved. And I know um, we've had some previous presentations that were given about upcoming grants, um, the license plate readers, there are things also coming down the pipeline from what you're sharing in the future. Correct. So I thank you for clarifying that. That's all I have. No. Ah, uh, no questions. No more comments or questions for me. Thank you. Thank you. Move on to committee member reports. Are there any committee member reports, comments, or requests for future agenda items? I guess the only one I would have is, so uh, as far as the city council, they approve the grants, but they don't actually give you money is what I, I'm understanding from what I've seen on, you know, in the past uh, meetings. So I would like to know um, how much is the city actually giving versus how much you guys are actually having to go out and get yourself as far as grants? That's what I would like to see in, in the future because it seems like there's a confusion with the city. Uh, what I've heard is that they think, oh, they're being approved by the council and they're in support, but it's actually grants that you, the, the police have actually gone to get and not actual money from the city. So I think that would be nice. We'll add that to the future agenda to discuss and, and present. Thank you. Good point. Um, so I have a few things. I want to first of all speak about um, the opportunity to have authorized observers at the community cleanups and sweeps that tend to happen in the Chinatown area. Um, I was informed that a few folks were witnessing when the police come and they do the sweeps and they also have the city employees there that the behavior is disrespectful, that there are comments being made, that a lot of individuals' personal belongings are being taken. This particular individual called the police because she was being approached by another officer there at the site and was asked to leave. Um, so an opportunity I see for this is those folks who are residents here and want to be present and to just observe or to provide any kind of emotional, moral support for those folks that we're also um, residents here in the city, if there could be a way that they are authorized observers, because you can have uh, observ you know, you can have folks that are present. They're not in any way interacting with officers, but they're witnessing what's happening. Um, so that would be a request. Um, I've also been told, and I don't know if this is true, if there is indeed still a community service officer or you have a designated sergeant um, that's working with the folks there in Chinatown when they have these sweeps and informing folks. And I know the most recent one was Caltrans, and it's a lot of different opinions about who was in charge and who was on first, but I think it would be good for us as PCAC members to know that there is a role for folks to observe without um, feeling harassed themselves. The racing situation is really unfortunate. Um, I am aware that there's a 41-year-old male who's also unhoused um, who was struck by the vehicle that was going 60 miles per hour on West Market Street, a 19-year-old driver. I don't think it's been updated who the other driver was, right? Um, this gentleman has a broken pelvis and was released by Natividad Hospital. And to my understanding, he does not have shelter at this time. So the issue of racing, right, um, brings up these other concerns because I know just recently in uh, San Benito County, there was a vehicular manslaughter where, I don't know if you're aware, there was a driver who clipped the car. Two young children were, were killed as a result. 
that gentleman is not going to do any time, though, because he had a clean record. So vehicular um, safety is a big deal. I know this incident just recently occurred. We have, even though the gentleman is still alive and has to heal, uh, we don't want to see that again. I don't want to see that again. So what do we do to address the racing? Um, I have seen three events myself. I've seen the Chipotle. There was a whole sideshow going on, music, fireworks um, at PetSmart. I saw one maybe about three weeks ago. And then I saw somebody doing donuts the other day by the Office Depot, right? So I understand this is a cultural thing. I understand that um, y y YOLO, right? They only live once, you're gonna live free. You wanna you know, do your little donuts and go ride the whip and everything. But how do we make this safe? Or how do we provide either designated areas or in unincorporated parts of the town where these people are going to do what they're going to do, but it can be safe, it can be in some way monitored. If you've got these drones, like how can it be kind of contained so that we don't have babies being hurt, 41-year-old men homeless with broken pelvises, and, and also sending a message that it's not cool to be flipping cars over at a very busy intersection here. We've got a senior living facility right there. We got two or three eateries right here. We got city council right here. Like, there was no need for that. So I, I hope, I know that you all are discussing it and maybe there's something developing around like safe racing or some kind of space that can be designated for that. Cause I don't think you can stop folks from, from racing. Those will be my two concerns. Thank you. Also, I want to thank the folks here because we have three folks in the crowd, and I think that's the most amount of people that I've seen that are not associated with the force. And I hope that the next door apps and all the chatter on Facebook and social media brings more folks here to be able to talk about what's on their minds and on their hearts and to just be aware of what the chief and other folks are doing in the meantime, between time. Thank you. Okay, uh, <clears throat> back in uh, March 26th, uh, police department had this uh, tri-tip fundraiser, tri-tip barbecue for the uh, fallen officers. So my wife called, uh, uh, I think it was you, I think, and uh, asking if uh, they needed any help. So I think the word was yes, so she immediately got on the phone and gathered up a crew and uh, I was part of it too. And we helped pack, pack the, the, you know, the food and have it ready for pickup. So uh, I, you know, I, we all did a good job and, and thank you officers. I think it was sold out and it was great. I was hoping that uh, maybe in between there, the ifs and nuts and all that, I would see people from this committee, but maybe they were not informed or I don't know what happened. But it would be nice if in the future, we can get the committee also helping out, so community can see that uh, you know community is also involved in. Yeah. So that was one. The other one is uh, I uh, be quite a few uh, well, a few years, a couple of years maybe, that I've been asking for um, for more transparency from police department because out, out there there's a lot of uh, negative neg negativism. Mm -hmm. Okay towards the police department, they don't do anything. We call them, blah, 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 okay. So we wanna change that, okay? Change it to something more positive. And I've been kind of thinking, well, what would be the best or one of the ways to do it? And uh, uh, Felicia, back then, Felicia said, well, you as a committee are supposed to be out in the community, you know? But before we do that, we need to be educated ourselves, okay? Right, so. Uh, <clears throat> So anyways, what I was asking is uh, from the Chief Felicia back then was to see uh, if he can come up with a way where uh, we can show the community what you guys are really doing so they can see. And then they say, oh, you know what? Yeah, great. So he suggested I check into police log, which I did. But it was so far behind that you, know, you can really make up any story of that. I was surprised uh, a couple of days back I think it's, I, I seen it current, so I, I, I got a copy of it. So I give it out to each uh, member here so they can get an idea. Uh, it's broken but down by uh, cases, 
Uh, also, I broke it down by district, and uh, how, how many, you know, this, uh, what kind of problems each district is having based on the rest or whatever. So we get a better idea. Do, now doing this, I mean, I, I feel more freely and more confident in going out to the community and say, you know, they're doing their job and, you know, here it is, you know. And uh, hopefully that would kind of turn things around a little bit. But I think we need more help from you guys educating us and where we can go out and help, you know, make the better picture of a, be more transparent. Thank you. Um, and once we go through them. Yeah. Um, I don't know if, if uh, I'm all right to say this, but I would like to make a comment or request or, or I'd like to see in the future if the director of the recreation department and the director of the public workers uh, make a presentation to us because I would like to know how they do uh, with those departments. I represent the district number two and I get a lot of complaints from the Montebella community for the last few years. So uh, I would like to know what happened because I know one side of the issues, but I know I don't know the other side from the from the city. And most of the time, I hear a lot of complaints about the park in Montebella, about some issues in. I just had a meeting with, with some of those uh, people that they live over there, and I wonder if we can have those kind of presentations here. And I'm looking for to see how I can help and find a solution to our community. Thank you. And we're over on time, but I do know that you wanted to make a quick comment, so we'll go ahead and do that. And, just, and thank you for this. Uh, I didn't know where it came from, so thank you, <laughs> Member De La Rosa. Um, and I don't see that vehicular or, you know, I don't know what category, so I don't know if you had a chance to see what we have up here. But oh, he doesn't have one. Oh, okay. So the ones that are continuous, like in, under investigation, open reports that have been made, where could we find that or is that also online? That was my follow-up question. And I guess he'll share this with you later on. Right? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, for my comment, just to kind of add to that, I know that we were purchasing or working on getting some sort of streamlined reporting that was similar to what is on the police log. So I guess maybe next meeting if we could just discuss where we're at with that system. I can't recall the exact name right now of, of the reporting and data collection that was going to be used. But if we could get a report on where we are with that um, and when we can start looking for that data. Um, with that, I'm going to adjourn the meeting. Our next, okay, one more quick comment. <laughs> Uh, Chief, I have a question here. Um, the issue on the, uh, the prostitutes here on Kern Street, okay, uh, I was told that um, there was going to be some kind of notice posted on the, on the motels and all that, not, in, not to allow to do what they do in, in you know, rent, rent out a room and all that, for that purpose. Uh, okay, what's one thing? Another thing that's kind of crossing my mind, and you can kind of guide me, help me on this, if, if, can, if it can be done. Uh, the restaurants, can they put up a dress code? You know, in other words, the way they're dressed, if they would help, if the restaurant would help if they put a dress code, say, we don't serve, blah, 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 you know? Sure. So would that help any? Or does, does it need to be, come from the state, an order, or what? 
Okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll go ahead and add further discussion to the prostitute issue to a future agenda item as well, please. Um, with that, we're going to adjourn the meeting. Our next meeting will be Wednesday, April 24th, 2024. And looking forward to seeing everybody there. Thank you all.